I can I can say that I was fairly warned uh, as I began study a few weeks ago. Um, actually, a little bit longer than that. Um, as I began my preparation and digging into Revelation, the end times, uh, one of uh, the, uh, the I'm, I'm reading, I'm watching, I'm, there's just there's a wealth of things that have uh, kind of, uh, that I'm distilling for this series. One of the comments I heard was one gentleman saying, it never fails. I bring up the end times and start talking and teaching about that and all hell breaks loose. All hell has broken loose, <laughs> but he is still Lord, and uh, this is good news. As Brian was saying, this is good news. So let me uh, jump right in this way. Somehow, some way, when I was a little kid, uh, my parents would find a way to somehow bring all of us seven kids on a summer vacation every year. Uh, seven kids. Nightmare. It had to be a nightmare. Uh, most years it was up to the uh, up in the Adirondack Mountains in Upper New York State. My grandparents lived up there in the summers, and we would go up and visit. And they lived on a little nine-hole golf course. That's where we all learned to play golf. I was five years old when we started going up there. Um, it was also so many square miles of nothing but nature. There was just no place for us to get in trouble. So that's a great place to bring seven kids. Uh, and if we would sit still long enough to listen, my dad would give us a preview of what was going to happen, especially for the younger ones like me, who possibly were uh, too young to remember or maybe had never been up there. And he would show us the map, show us the route that we were going to take, how long it was going to take. And he, was, he would say, we're going up to New York, but you won't see a big city. Matter of fact, most of it's going to be wilderness. So, and he said, when we drive up the big hills on the way there, your ears may pop. That's okay. That's normal. We'll probably see some deer up there too, maybe even a bear or some other wild stuff. And there will be bugs. This I know. There will be bugs like you've never seen and you cannot imagine. And wouldn't you know it, he was right about everything. My ears did pop. Uh, we did not see a big city. We did see both deer and bear and some other stuff. And our swollen, bit-up arms and legs testified to the experience with New York black flies that would horrify any visitor. Eileen and Tim, amen back there? Oh my gosh, you can't imagine. Here's the point. The point is, our Father told us what to expect. Our Heavenly Father has done the same. He's told us what to expect. Did you know that? Uh, 27 to 30% of your Bible is prophecy. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Revelation, these are all prophetic books. To dismiss prophecy is to dismiss almost a third of the Bible. And I get it. It can be confusing. It can be unsettling, uh, especially when there are people out there that enjoy being alarmists. Makes a lot of Christians step back and say stuff like, okay, just give me the simple stuff, you know? Give me the Lord's Prayer, the Golden Rule, the 23rd Psalm, you know, Proverbs. That's enough for me. That's all I need. I'm not even interested in the rest. But deep down, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we know better. We know that God's, it's all, the whole counsel of God's Word. The Bible is all of God's Word to us, and it means something to us. It has meaning for our lives. All right. Uh, one, of the, one of the very popular speakers in our day is a guy by the name of Jordan Peterson. A lot of you guys have, have heard him, you know him. Really smart guy, not a follower of Jesus at this point in time, but it does seem like he's getting closer and closer and closer. But he respects God, respects the Bible, respects Jesus, and he argues for God in a very, very astute way. He calls the Bible the very first hyperlinked book in history, even though it's thousands of years old. There's all these connections. There's a um, 65, 63 to 65,000 cross-references throughout the book. This verse links back to that one, which links to this one 500 years later and so on. It's miraculous. It's a really cool image of that. You can see this. This is, this is all the different connections they make between the books and the verses in Bible. It's, it's amazing. It's miraculous. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies have already been fulfilled across the globe, and they continue to be. A matter of fact, they are unfolding before us at an unprecedented rate right now. I will say this. There is 
kind of an ebb and flow when it comes to the amount of emphasis that end times prophecy gets. Uh, if you were a, a believer like I was back in the late 70s and the 80s, uh, there, it seemed to be very forefront. There was lots of speculation about the end times back then. And after a spurious but popular book came out in the mid-80s called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in the Year 1988, which obviously was not accurate, well, it seemed like Bible prophecy attention, at least, kind of waned uh, from that point on. Not many people wanted to take a chance on speculation, get it wrong, and then be mocked after that. So it got relatively quiet in Christendom uh, regarding the end times. That is beginning to change as world events continue to build towards a climax. It's happening now. We're not just in the end times. We're in the end of the end times. Or better said, the end is not near. The end is here. And I think you're going to be convinced of that by the end of the series. Now, I, I live in the real world. I am not sequestered into church world, you know, having no contact with non-believers. Not, that's not the case at all. I mix and talk to non-Christians all the time, like every day. So I have lots of conversations with folks who do not believe what I believe, nor do they live like I live. Um, and that's fine. That's great for a couple of reasons. One, it keeps life exciting. And second, it provides lots of opportunities for me to point people to Jesus. And in my opinion, there's nothing more important in this world that we can do. Having said that, I do get some challenging questions from people from time to time. And one of them is some version of, of this. Someone saying, like, why with the end times already? Why do you got to keep talking about the end of time, doom and gloom, judgment and disaster? How do you even know there's going to be an end? And if there is, why talk about it? It's depressing. <laughs> you know, they say other the news and other religions don't even seem to say much about it at all. So not, why not you just leave well enough alone? Let everybody do their thing. You know, you do you. That's what everybody says these days. So why don't you just live your life and quit trying to scare the rest of us? I get that. Nobody likes to be scared. But I didn't make this stuff up. <laughs> it's not like I, I came up with this stuff or anybody in this room came up with this stuff. End times prophecy and teaching has been around for 2,500 years. So it's nothing new. It started long before the New Testament was even a thing. There are four major Old Testament prophets that speak of end time events. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, and Daniel, and Isaiah. They all speak of end time prophecy. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at a lot of it along with a lot from the book of Revelation. Here's an important starting point on all this. And this is hard for us to get sometimes as Americans. When it comes to end time prophecy, America is not the center of the world. And some that's like gasp, <laughs> shock and horror, you know. It's a realization for some of us that I am not, you are not, America is not the center of the world. The center of the world is the nation and the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. When God gave the promised land to the nation of Israel way back early in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 12, God said some words which are still pertinent today. It's very simple, but very certain. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So regardless of what you feel or think about the nation of Israel, you've got to admit, how can it be that this tiny little seemingly insignificant nation be constantly in the news. It is the size of New Jersey, and it never leaves the news. How can it be that a ridiculous amount of nations on this earth hate Israel with an everlasting hatred, and they want nothing more than to exterminate it off the face of the earth? doesn't make sense. Nobody wants to exterminate the Norwegians off the face of the earth. Nobody wants to exterminate the Argentinians. They want to exterminate the Jews. Doesn't make sense. Unless, unless God himself has set them apart and called them his own. Unless God himself spoke eternal truths regarding the past and the future to them, and Israel is center stage. It began there, and it will end there. That's why. That's the reason. Almost all scholars believe that the end times officially began in 1948 
when Israel officially became a nation. That began the prophetic clock ticking. And since then, prophetic fulfillment has been accelerating ever since. Now, even though lots of generations throughout the ages have all kind of speculated that they were in the end times, it just was not possible. There were certain things that absolutely had to happen for it to be so. And one huge thing was Israel becoming a nation. The dominoes began to fall then, and they continue to fall. So the signs of the times are all around us. And most believe that we have come to a critical and unstoppable point so significant that nothing can be done by anyone or anything to keep it from happening. There's no going back. We are steamrolling towards the end of the age. Now, don't let that alarm you. If you're a believer and a follower of Jesus, there is nothing to fear. And this whole series might be a wake-up call for you. But like Brian said, it is good news. There is good news. And if you immediately begin to hyperventilate when someone starts talking about the end times, you've probably been listening to the wrong people. It's okay to be sobered by this. It's not okay to be scared by it. If you're a believer and a follower of Jesus. If you are not, well, there's plenty of reason to be freaked out by it. Plenty of reason. So at least just tune in for a few weeks So you can learn how to be comforted by this and not traumatized by it. You don't have to live in fear just because this part of the big story is coming to an end. And the truth is, the way you view the story of humanity will dictate whether you are fearful or faith-filled in these days. So let me just quickly share a contrast with you that was put together by a pastor friend of mine. He said, which of these two stories is more your story? Here's the first one. We live in a world with many beautiful things, yet much of it is broken, including people. Nothing can be done about it except to survive it, make it marginally better until we die, and after that, probably nothing. Here's the second story. We live in a beautiful world with many beautiful things, yet much of it is desperately broken, including people. However, we believe that someone created all this beauty And the brokenness of this world is not his intent, not his purpose. It's not his doing. He intends good for both the world and the people in it. In fact, this creator cared so much for his creation that he became one of us, taking on all the pain and brokenness to himself, even to the point of dying for it. But yet that did not end his story either. He rose again from the dead and is recreating the world, beginning with those people who love and follow him. And one day, he will fix absolutely everything in this world with his perfect justice. And he will restore the beauty with which his world was created to begin with. And we will live and reign with him forever. Which of those two stories is better? It's the second one, isn't it? The second one is not just the better story. It's also the truer story. It's both more truthful and more beautiful. God's story is beautiful. The story of humanity, well, it's ugly and disappointing until God becomes a part of our story. Then it all changes. The final chapter is still God writing his beautiful story involving the people that he created and he loves And it's just that, this is important, it's just that this final chapter, friends, is where we see the age of grace come to an end and the age of God's perfect justice is executed. That's what we're talking about. He is held back from that for the sake of grace. Paul, uh, The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 2.4, he says, Do you despise the riches of his kindness and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Now, we have all heard the words of those that have contempt for God and for the Bible and for Christianity. They say things like, yeah, yeah, some God, some God. You really believe in a God who would let all this horror and suffering and evil take place? That's really an ignorant stance to take when you think about it. (laughs) Because you think about it this way. If God were to squash every trace of evil in the world in one fell swoop, which of us would be left? Are you perfect? 
God has chosen not to do that for the sake of grace. It's his kindness that holds off perfect justice. He desires none to be squashed, but all to come to repentance. But in the end, that opportunity vanishes. Just not there anymore. Like it stated in Hebrews chapter 10, at some point it says, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sin, but only the fearful prospect of judgment to come. Those are sobering words. So, in the time that remains today in this introductory message of the series, I want to show us five truths about Bible prophecy. Five truths about Bible prophecy. Because the Bible's prophetic material distinguishes it from every other book in the world. Almost 30% of it is prophetic in nature, and a large portion of that is end times prophecy. Now, the reason that's a big deal is because without prophecy, there are are no signs of the times. There is no interpreting of current events because we have no idea what the end looks like. You know, how do you say that these are the signs of the times when you have no signs of the times? But with God's word, we have that knowledge. We know what the end looks like. We have a wealth of end times prophecy, so we know what to look for, okay? So five truths about Bible prophecy. Here's the first one. The only one who can predict the future with absolute certainty is the one who controls it. You can't predict with certainty if you don't have any control over it. So the only, the only one who can predict the future with absolute certainty is the one who controls it or a direct resent, re- representative of the one who controls it. God controls the future. Consequently, God's messages about the future are our only reliable source of truth about it. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. God gives prophecy, according to the word, God gives prophecy to warn unbelievers and to comfort believers. So I'll ask, how do you respond when you hear about Bible prophecy? If it brings fear to you, you might not be ready for the turn of our Lord. And that needs to be addressed. There's, it's way too important to ignore. Through a proper understanding of Bible prophecy, you lose all fear and dread, and instead you have peace, and you can trust God with it. I mean, there is unprecedented turmoil that is coming. But there's not just good news that comes along with it, but the very, very best news. Third thing, prophecy gives us assurance that the Bible is true. Gives us assurance that the Bible's true. In other words, the Bible tells truth about the future. How do we know that? Because so many things that the Bible told us would happen have already happened. And as God fulfills what the Bible foretold, we've got concrete measurable proof that the Bible and all of its prophecies are true. Fourth thing, the Bible and the Christian faith have no rival when it comes to understanding the future. No other book in the world, no other religion can come close to predicting the future in advance as the, in the way that the Bible has done. There is only one God and his version of world events is the only sure picture about what's going to happen in the future. His picture of it. Fifth, this is a big one. This is a big one. Confirmation of the Bible's truth depends upon the truth of its prophetic writings. I mean, if those prophecies all along the way didn't or don't come true, then the credibility of the entire Bible is in jeopardy, including the claims about Jesus. However, the Bible's truth is easy to measure. We can know the the accuracy of the Bible's predictions and prophecies because they're incredibly specific. I mean, incredibly specific. It's not like the Bible says, in the last days there will be a man and a city and a horse. No, it gets incredibly specific. And yeah, most of it revolves around the nation and the people of Israel. Why? Because they're better than us? No, not at all. It's just that we've got to recognize that God himself created them, chose them as an example to the world, and entered into a covenant with them specifically. It has been an incredible blessing and an unbearable burden for them. They are unique, and they are uniquely hated by billions of people. A British journalist by the name of William Norman Norman Ewer once wrote this little anti-Semitic ditty, little poem went like this. How odd of God to choose the Jews. That was it. He meant it as an insult. How odd of God to choose the Jews. A great poet and writer, Ogden Nash, countered it with this. He said, 
but not so odd as those who choose a Jewish God yet spurn the Jews. <laughs> it's a pretty good comeback. So those who truly love God understand that to love him is to appreciate his covenant people and to remember the words from Genesis way back in the beginning, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. To this day, to this day, there has never been a world power that persecuted the Jews that remained great. They all took it on the chin. Okay, last thing, I want to just point out three reasons why we should bless Israel and value the Jews. Here's the first thing. They were created by God. In Genesis 12, God uh, says, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your family, and your father's household, and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and you shall be a blessing, he says. There's never been another nation that was formed by God himself. And the survival of the people of Israel against all odds is proof of God's active providence in the lives of his people. Here's the second thing. They are in an eternal covenant with God. In Genesis 12, God says, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. He gave them the land. They're in a covenant with God. Now, in the new covenant, the New Testament, with all people, we are invited to be a part of that. And we are adopted. The New Testament says we are adopted into his family, into his people. Now, the Jewish people are still individual humans and have a responsibility to bow the knee to the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. Salvation comes through him and through him alone by trusting him as our forgiver and our leader. Okay, here's the third thing. They're a blessing to all the nations, all the nations. God says to Abram, in you, all the families, all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So it's not just for Israel's sake, not at all. It's for the whole world. And you know what? The Jewish people have blessed the world like no other people ever, ever. Just think of three gifts that the Jewish people have given the world, the whole world. First, they gave us the most important man in history, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Messiah, and he is Jewish. Second thing is, they also gave us the most important book in history, the Bible. Jewish people wrote every word of it. This 100% Jewish book has given light for the path of our lives. Thirdly, they've, the Jewish people have given us the most important organization in the world, the church. The church. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended and the church was born, 100% of the people that first received the Spirit of God were Jewish. 100% of the audience that heard the first Christian sermon were Jewish. Most important man, most important book, most important organization. We bless the Jews, for by them they, they have blessed all the nations of the earth. Okay, that's laying a lot of groundwork. I know, I know. But... In order for us to have context, I mean, without a, a grasp of Israel's place in history and in the end times, most of it wouldn't have enough context. Now it will. So you've got to, you've got to build a foundation really strong before you build up. And next week, we're building up, baby. <laughs> next, next week, next Sunday, the rapture of the church and the seven years of tribulation. So fasten your seatbelts. It's going to get interesting. Okay? Why don't you bow your heads and we'll pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we value your word. We draw life from your word. It's the light for our path. Thank you for giving us your word. And Lord, we, we pray that you'd speak to us um, today and over the next handful of weeks. And um, like your word says, comfort our hearts about the days that are coming. Um, see the hope that is coming, the, uh, the severity of the times that are coming, and how to conduct ourselves in that time. Uh, we look to you, Lord, and we recognize that this is a sobering sort of thing 
And Lord, we can still look at it as good news that's coming from you and that there is life and hope uh, that you bring to us through all this. Uh, give us wisdom, we pray, Lord, where I come up short, I pray that you would fill in the, the gaps and, and over, override me where I fall short. Um, our desire, Lord, is to partake of your truth, and we depend upon you for that. And we know you can do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.